Hello again. Welcome everybody to another episode of Grow Yourself from the Inside Out. You know, I have a question here for this uh, for this episode, and, and it's you know it's it's I'm sure you know just a rhetorical question is is what I'm going with here. But the question is: Is have you ever felt depleted? And and what I mean is is where that uh, I guess you could say. Well, we have a guest who's going to answer this for us, but I guess you could say where that inner flame just feels like it is about to blow out. I think most of us, most of us have, have felt that way. And of course, you know, I'm referring to this idea of, of burnout. I think I certainly can speak for myself and others that I know that oftentimes we feel that, that depletion, that that dimming of the light, if you will, of the flame, but we just keep going for a lot of different reasons. And I could say for myself and perhaps others, it's often just because, you know what? I don't have time to be burned out, you know? And so you just keep going, you weather yourself through it. Some um, maybe get that second wind, if, if I could change metaphors here. But the uh, But the real question is, you know, if you don't get that sort of second wind, if you're not able to just re regain that momentum and that feeling that you're back on your stride, you know, what's the end game? Where does it stop? You know, what, what's going to happen uh, with, with all of that, uh, with that flame. I mean, if we, if, again, if we sort of stuck with this metaphor, the flame is dimming, dimming getting uh, smaller and smaller, what is represented by the flame going out? What is that? And so I have really a terrific guest here to whom we're going to speak about that, this idea of burnout and and maybe even the other side of it, you know, uh, talking a little bit more about joy and happiness and other sorts of things. So if I may, I want to introduce my guest. My special guest today is Dr. Mary Sanders. She has over 25 years of experience as a self-employed businesswoman and consultant. However, and with that, uh, about 15 years ago, she experienced burnout uh, firsthand and suggests that she crashed hard. But at the time, she didn't have the necessary tools or resources to navigate this difficult period in her life. So she panicked and ran away to the other side of the world. Now, we're going to ask her exactly what she meant by that. Was that like literally on the other side of the world? Or is that also a bit of a, a, a metaphor, if you will? Now, she wholeheartedly uh, is committed to supporting women, and I suppose others, uh, who want to transform the way they show up in the world and experience thriving, healthy happiness, uh, health, happiness, and purpose, utilizing the tools of energy medicine, we'll ask her about that, chiropractic, uh, functional blood chemistry analysis, and positive psychology, which we all should be a part uh, should be into. So Mary earned her doctorate in chiropractic from Logan College of Chiropractic in St. Louis, uh, Missouri. She completed her certificate in positive psychology from the Holbein Institute in Lenox, Massachusetts, and studied under Dr. Tal Ben Shahar, who I've heard of, uh, kind of a you know happiness guru. I don't know a lot about him, but I'm uh, certainly uh, familiar with him. But in addition, she completed her master's in intuition medicine. Is that right? Intuition Medicine from the Academy of Intuition Medicine in Sausalito, California, and studied under Dr. Francesca McCartney. So we're going to ask her about all of that. In any event, please do welcome my special guest, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Mary, we'll call her, Sanders. Mary, thank you so much for being here with us on Grow Yourself. Kevin, I have to say, first and foremost, the pleasure is all mine, sincerely. And before we get started, I would just like to applaud you and all of your efforts as you've been standing for personal growth, professional transformation now for 20, 30 years. You've impacted not only corporations and government branches and other smaller businesses. And I quite honestly, I think that you're taking it from the a very holistic approach in allowing people the space for self-regulation with their emotions and being able to understand better their soft skills and to empower themselves to be the leaders that they want to believe or to be. 
Wow. So thank you so much. Well, I got to say, um, <laughs> maybe this is the first time, but, you know, Dr. Mary has done her homework. <laughs> You know, thank you uh, really for for uh, acknowledging that. And yes, you know, I, I'll be honest with you, I do. And that's a beautiful thing, of course, about podcasting. We were, we were talking about that earlier is the beautiful thing is it kind of goes with my style and my approach to everything. And that is I'm curious and I have a lot of questions. And so as yeah. we talk about all these things and to your point about the work that I've done in my past, it, uh, it's certainly been rewarding, but for me, it continues to bring up more questions and ideas that I can thrive on and learn and grow and change more. So thank you for that very nice sort of uh, introduction that uh, that came back to me. Very nice of me. Very impressive background. And, uh, you know, I might also say I love your website. It's a very, very uh, it's a very inviting website. And so we are certainly going to invite people to see that. Uh, later on. So let's just start with uh, this, Dr. Mary. Just, let, let me just ask, you know, first of all, where are you at? Where are you coming from us right now? And, you know, and then maybe just tell us, you know, who is Mary Sanders? Sure. Today I'm calling in from Boulder, Colorado. Love it, man. Yeah. And this has been our home for approximately nine months. Prior to that, oh. we were in Portland, Oregon. Prior to that was a whole nine years of international living. So I'll wow. share a little bit about that. Yeah. That's fascinating. And that's great to hear. So, yeah, do tell us a little bit about, you know, where you were raised, just a little bit about your ba background. Yeah. I know it seems like the obvious thing to do, but quite frankly, I just love to hear about from whence people came. Yeah. Thanks for asking, Kevin. Sincerely. Um, you know, in order for you and your audience to better understand who I am, I have to go way back. Go way so back. So bear, bear with me and I will <laughs> eventually get around to some of the more current issues. But I was um, born hearing impaired. I hear half of what a normal hearing person hears. And I went undiagnosed for the first three years of my life. So imagine being a small person. And you hear the wah, 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 but you don't really understand that there's context coming from those spoken words. So what I spent the first three years of my life was really connecting with the emotion that people exude, the energy that comes from people, the love that, that emanates from people. And so when I first got diagnosed at the age of three, it wasn't until I was maybe five or six that I got my first hearing aid. And for the first time in my life, I heard birds and I heard the birds and the beauty of the sound. And there was a whole new world that I was being exposed to. Now, during those first three years, first five years, I can honestly say now I know that I was like living in this kind of quasi spiritual realm to where um, I was receiving information using my extrasensory perception. And I trained myself. That's how I received my information. Now, I was raised, both of my parents were educators. They were good Catholic raising family of, you know, three daughters. And I think I made a conscious choice that I wanted to belong to this family and I wanted to be loved and I wanted to be part of this group. And so I desensitized some of my perception and I was mainstream through school and I maybe had a glimpse of intuition throughout my young adolescence, but it really wasn't spoken about, nor did I act upon it. So when I went to undergraduate school, I studied chemistry and zoology. So I got really heavy into the hard sciences. Mm. And then three days after my undergraduate graduation, I ended up in chiropractic school. <laughs> now, all of a sudden, I'm around a group of people who are talking about the body's innate ability to heal itself, that you can heal yourself from the inside out. And oh, by the way, there is an energy frequency that emanates from all of us. So I knew that I was in the right place and I was choosing the right profession. So I graduated at the ripe age of 25 and I immediately decided I wanted to be self-employed. Now I hadn't taken any business courses. So clearly at 25, I thought I had like figured out. I thought I really knew all of the answers and I was going to do it on my own. I started off in the back porch of an old Victorian in downtown Colorado Springs. Mm. I had my portable adjusting table 
in a table that I picked up at some thrift shop, right? So I stayed there for approximately a year, making tons of mistakes, not even knowing how to run a business. And then somehow, some way, within 18 months, I ended up building out an 1,800 square foot facility and wow. opened up, yeah, and opened up a wellness center. So all of a sudden, I invited an acupuncturist, a neurolinguistic programmer. I had some active rehabilitation, some massage therapist. I was developing a center. And when was this? 1996. That's pretty impressive. Yeah, that's kind of at the front end of some of these things, right? Yes. Yes, Mm -hmm. it was. And I can honestly tell you that I still had purple hair back then in a very (laughs) conservative community. So I I really was a little bit more outspoken than what I probably uh, ought to have been. But nonetheless... (laughs) <laughs> um, I was learning the hard way. I was making a lot of mistakes and a few successes along the way, and the successes <clears throat> eventually added up. So then a several years passed, and then I decided to embark upon a freestanding building of 5,000 square feet, larger facility, larger staff. And if that wasn't enough, then I decided to uh, start consulting for other chiropractors throughout the United States and speaking and doing speaking engagements as well. Decided to open up a second practice, decided to order or to hire more uh, doctors, more staff, and it became bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger to where, honestly, Kevin, I found myself in a state of extreme unhappiness. Oh, interesting. interesting. I was working for an overhead. I did not have a life. I didn't have engaging relationships. I was losing the meaning of what it was that I was living for and why I had started from to be a chiropractor at such a young age. I had lost all of that. So what was happening was pretty magnificent hindsight. It wasn't magnificent when I was experiencing it, but my body started to talk to me, started to talk to me in subtle ways, mm-hmm. and I chose to ignore them because I was running a relatively high volume practice and I couldn't possibly slow down in order to take care of myself. So there were a series of big markers that led me up to essentially, um, I blew a cervical disc and I was having issues looking down at patients without tears running down my eyes. And so I literally would be working on people and their t-shirts or their shirts would be soaking up my tears. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, you know, that's that's not right. Um, That's not the position that one should be in if they are providing service to another person. So I really was outside of my boundaries of being able to to do that. And to make a long story short, the neck issue healed. And that wasn't I didn't address the underlying causative root. And Mm -hmm. one night I literally just rolled over and blew out all of my entire right shoulder. So now I have a neck that can't move. I have an arm that can't be lifted over my head. And quite honestly, I still didn't slow down. So my husband watched and witnessed these all of these years. And finally, one evening after I literally fell asleep at the dinner table, he he looked me in the eye and he said, something has to change. You either something. If you don't change, then if if you don't make some changes, uh, you're going to have a serious illness on your hands. And quite honestly, he was questioning whether or not our relationship would would last. Wow. So he started asking me some really important questions. He's like, could you leave this all? And at the time, Kevin, I was like, no, 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 no. You don't understand. I started something from scratch. I built it into something. This essentially is my baby. There's Mm -hmm. no way that I am going to walk away from this. And he said, well, what if we could go and live? And he knew what to ask. He said, what if we could go and live internationally? And I said, well, that's a great question. You have my attention. So he, my husband, is in uh, international education, and he acquired a job in Ho Chi Minh City. And it became a conversation, well, I got this job, honey, it starts in 45 days. Are you with me? And I thought about it, and I was like, yeah, I'm with you. 
So in 45 days, we sold the home, got rid of our, our, our materialistic possessions. I let go of two different businesses and off we went. So I woke up on the other side of the world, literally in a Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam, wondering who I was. What do I stand for? What is my purpose? And why am I here on earth? And I went through a huge identity crisis as a direct result of the extreme burnout. So I did what I what I needed to do, and I went down to Bali, Indonesia, and I completed my yoga teacher tra uh, training and certification and got heavily into meditation. And I had time on my hands for the first time in my life, Kevin. I had time. So I sat in formal meditation every day, and I watched really wonderful, magical experiences happen for me. So finally, the scientific brain activated and said, okay, let's wrap your head around this, Mary. You know the body extremely well from the neck on down. You know, you know anatomy, you know physiology, you know chemistry, you know what's happening. But what's happening in the brain? <laughs> and so I was like, I need to understand and embrace the neuropsychology behind meditation. And that is when I would travel from Ho Chi Minh City back to New York to Lenox, Massachusetts, and studied underneath Tal Ben Shahar in, uh, for positive psychology. Mm. And then I got fascinated by the content. He essentially was talking about the science of happiness and what essentially allows people to thrive. And thriving for, you know, Kevin, every person is different as to how they perceive challenges and how they respond to those challenges. Mm -hmm. So Tal said, well, if you really want to make a difference, utilizing positive psychology, go back and apply it in corporations or governments or within religious organizations or within education, I should say. So my husband and I decided to partner and do our strengths together. And we started a nonprofit organization to help support teachers in better understanding the tools of positive psychology. So we taught them how to meditate, how to express gratitude, how to be more present in the classroom and to be good role models for the students. So that was fascinating. And I was, so in this time, I guess I should say, we left Ho Chi Minh City mm -hmm. and moved to uh, South America. We went to Bogota, Colombia. And the, the Latin American community soaked up our content. Very interesting. So as fast as I could create the content, it was being translated into Spanish. And we were working with a large school group in Lima, Peru, and they were dispersing all the information to their 60 plus schools at the time. And, you know, I was removed because I don't speak Spanish eloquently enough to be able to do professional development for these teachers, sure. but I was able to create the content. And then finally, one day, I got the opportunity to visit some of the schools where this information was being displayed. And I was beside myself, meaning that the impact, I had no idea how absorbed, I mean, it was like the community was just absorbing this content like a sponge. I mm. was so honored and so humbled. So then time passed, and I realized that education was my husband's sphere. So I was like, I know professionally I'm not done. And I know that I want to be of service, but I don't want to be tied down to a specific location. So I knew all along that we have an electromagnetic force that surrounds all of us and within us as well. And so that's what led me to enroll in the Masters of Intuition Medicine curriculum in Sausalito, California. And there I learned how to expand upon my intuition in ways that I never even knew were possible. So then I end up being a medical intuitive. So now, follow me, we're here in, uh, what month are we? <clears throat> we're in July of 2022. And in the last six months, I have been working on rebranding myself to authentically show up in all of my strengths. So I have life experience um, in burnout. I have my professional experience in chiropractic and functional nutrition. I have experience in positive psychology and energy medicine. 
So I have now created and designed a program that takes an integrative approach to burnout, utilizing the various different modalities that I just listed out. Wow. Yeah. So here I am talking to you today. That is just really amazing. And what a great um, sort of, uh, and quite succinct, you know, understanding of your, your life and how it, you know, I often p- ask people, you know, how did, you know, where did you come from and how did you land today? Man, that was just really incredible the way that you spelled that out. You know, I have to, I, I can't, uh, <clears throat> I can't resist but to mention a little synchronicity going on here. And that is that we had talked earlier about one of my other guests was um, a retired um, executive vice president of IBM. And he and I talked a lot about kind of what you said earlier. He said, you know, if in fact, he wrote a book called If Nothing Changes, Nothing Changes. And you were saying that. And then what else did we discuss? His what is his favorite country where he spent a lot of time in Vietnam? I mean, I just went now. I mean, that's that doesn't happen that often that uh, two people back to back are speaking along the same line. Very, very interesting what you're saying. So so let me ask you, Mary, then. How would you, I guess it doesn't have to be a formal definition, but I think most of us sort of kind of know what burnout is. We've experienced it in some form or fashion, but how would you define it either formally or just just in your own words? Sure. Well, first I'll define it kind of like based upon my own personal experience. Mm. And that is literally depleting all the gas that's in your tank. And then when you have the opportunity to refuel, all you can refuel with is one gallon at a time. Oh my. So it goes, the energy goes away super fast. Mm. Now, um, I just I completed a five day boot camp specifically on burnout. And we were talking about the three different formal, again, this is the formal definition of sure. burnout, but we were talking about the three components of burnout. The first one being emotional exhaustion. The second one being cynicism, mm. and the third one being professional efficacy. Interesting. Now, yeah, and when you think about it, Kevin, most all of us on the call today can say, okay, emotional exhaustion. Well, to me, that kind of feels like physically I'm excessively tired, I'm exhausted, I'm depleted. I can relate to that. Yes, When it comes to cynicism, and I know with your corporate background, this will make sense to you in that there's a certain element of distrust that happens in a person and their organization. They start distrusting upper management or distrusting uh, the pathway that this corporation is going. And with that, there becomes a certain level of pessimism that goes along with that. Yes. Then the personal or the professional efficacy is you know that you have a skill set and you want to be able to apply it to a project and have the confidence and the self-worth to create a deliverable. And if you lack the confidence in this skill set, then it's going to affect your professional efficacy. Yes. So there are so many different deviations, right? Because once you have classified those three different components, then you can say, well, what if somebody's just literally physically depleted? Well, that is exhaustion. But what if somebody is low on the professional uh, uh, efficacy? Well, that essentially is just them being ineffective or having that experience. So there's so many different ways that you can define burnout, and it's a personal situation for each and every single person. And that's why I use the formal MassLock burnout inventory as a formal assessment. Um, I have to say that you know it's a researched and verifiable um, inventory, if you will. Interesting, yeah. And the feedback's really spot on. Wow, that's fascinating. I, I have to admit, I would have never considered cynicism as a as an aspect of burnout, you know, certainly, but the way that you define it, it does make sense. I mean, uh, if I were to put it in like really layman's terms, yeah, I would be like, yeah, I'm just kind of tired of hearing all the BS and tired of you and I don't want to hear it. And, you know, maybe something along that lines. That's fascinating though. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to burnout, then, um, 
you know, I, I think, I, I guess I'm, and I'm really asking, you know, that I, I think, you know, people maybe get to a place where they're burned out and they're like, I'm burned out. But, you know, are there telltale signs, you know, along the way that you you can recognize before you get to that place where you just have no more gas in the tank? Yeah. Um, I would like to answer this question as directly as I can, but I want to talk about some of the physiology as to what happens as a Feel direct free. response from, from stress. And initially, the first thing that happens when somebody is under stress, the adrenals, which sit on top of the kidneys, one of the endocrine systems, go into kind of like this fight or flight mode, and they pop up. And then mm. they realize that that stress is not going away, long-term chronic stress, then they begin to shrink down. Mm. Now, the adrenal system itself is one of the endocrine organs, and all the endocrine organs are affiliated with producing hormones. So specifically for the adrenals, you'll produce adrenaline, epinephrine, norepinephrine, DHEA, cortisol, just to name a few. And when there becomes an imbalance of hormones, it causes a cascade of events in the other endocrine systems. So it creates a negative feedback cycle. So the telltale, the telltale signs are you're not sleeping well through the night. You have a difficult time waking up in the morning. You're depending on caffeine to get that get up and go kind of energy. You find yourself eating lunch and then all of a sudden you crash. You need a little bit of chocolate. Maybe you need a, a Coke in the afternoon. And then you can barely keep your eyes open at night for dinner. And then you crash. And maybe you have some alcohol in there so that you can fall asleep a little bit easier. And then you wake up and do the whole cycle again the next day. Now, that probably defines 80% of Americans. Interesting. I will not confirm or deny that I have experienced what you just said. <laughs> I mean, you and, know, almost uh, straight down that list. That's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. And then I'm going to talk about a second component, and that's the emotional component that's happening within uh, within the system as well. And this is, I think, an important key point for the listeners to understand, and that is emotionally, right? So you're going through the physical, physical exhaustion, so you're possibly feeling overwhelmed, overworked, a little bit of anxiety associated with the workload. You begin to kind of isolate yourself. You're not as engaging with other people. Perhaps you start to feel lonely. And all of these responses are very similar to trauma responses. Wow. So if somebody has sustained a trauma, and we're not going to define what trauma is because we know that it's multifaceted in so many domains, but you're having a stress response that runs very parallel to a trauma response. And sometimes your body can't distinguish between the two. So that is why some people can go through and, and decide that they're going to make a radical life change and say, okay, I quit. Wow. We're, in the, we're, in the, we're in the world of the great resignation. People have said, are saying, I've had enough. I've had mm -hmm. enough. So some of these people are going to take the time to rest and to recuperate, and then they're going to go back into the workforce, whatever that looks like. And the same triggers will be there on a neurological level within their body, within their emotions. So even though they've taken the time to, to, to recover from the recharge, burnout, yeah. They, yeah, they have those same triggers within their system. So they're, so, you, you know, if we were to say that they're the great resignation sort of you know, if, if at some point you can say that it's somewhat over, I think what I, I'm hearing you say, however, is that everybody's bringing that stuff back to the workplace. Possibly. That, that thinking, that that whatever it is. Possibly. And that's why I have created a program that's pretty innovative. I mean, it's the approach from an integrative perspective to address the mind, body, and spirit. So if someone goes through this and is committed to the process of doing the inner work, 
for the healing and the transformation, then perhaps when they come back to work, they have a different mindset. They have a different belief system. Perhaps they're no longer striving for perfectionism. Mm. These are tools that, if embraced, can truly transform the way that people show up at work. Mm. And so would part of that be, uh, Dr. Mary, also dealing with expectations? Because I find personally that this is one of the, the big things that we all struggle with either knowingly or not knowingly is that we have expectations about how things should be or will be. And that contributes to a lot of, um, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say necessarily burnout, but certainly um, if people feel recharged, feel like they've kind of got it back together and go back into, let's say corporate America and they expect things to be differently and they're not, I could see a big uh, train wreck there. Yeah, I agree. And what you're describing is um, talking about the neuroplasticity of the brain mm. and rewiring the brain to create new neurological pathways to have a different and new experience. You don't have to go back down that same pathway. And you were talking a moment ago about expectations, perceived expectations, yes. whether it's conscious or unconscious. So when you do the energy energy medicine work, we will look at where those memories were ingrained in what belief systems go along with it and where if perhaps you store it within the physical body. That's pretty scientific right there. Uh, you know, as you describe it, I mean, it's more than just, you know, sort of, you know, frou-frou kind of ideas. Let me ask you something. This might kind of peel us off in a little bit of a different direction, but you know, I'll beg you to come back, you know, bring us back into, you know, if, because you really have a, a very, a very nice uh, coordinated way of dis dis discussing things. But you mentioned spirituality. Now, for me, I can be a practicing Christian, albeit, you know, many times not a very good one. And a fair amount of my audience, not necessarily intentionally, but I know are, are Christians. So when you talk about spirituality, you know, how do you define that? And how does that sort of you know, fit into the schema of the, the, the Christian tradition or philosophy of thinking when we talk about spirituality? Sure. Kevin, I um, view spirituality from a very inclusive paradigm. Okay. I do. And the reason that I say that is that positive psychology talks about being in alignment, being purpose-driven and connected to something that is greater than yourself outside of yourself very nice so who am i to define what that is for people just as long as they have that connection mm. oh i mean okay. that's that's interesting i mean I, I and i i do understand what you're saying i think i do think partially from the standpoint that um especially today because to your point spirituality is sort of discussed in different ways I'm not here to judge who, what, what way other people ought to do that. But I do sometimes sense that when people think too broadly about spirituality, they don't quite understand what it is. You know, where, where is the, where do I find that spirituality? And of course, mm -hmm. not only the Christian tradition, if you will, but many of the more religious, the religions, if you will, they give you that target, you know, it's God or it's Jesus Christ or whatever the case might be. So, mm -hmm. Um, so I guess, I mean, maybe there's not even a question except to say that's very interesting the way that you, you uh, yeah. pose that. And I would agree with you, Kevin. Sometimes the term spirituality does not include religion. And mm. some people are more comfortable to saying I'm spiritual and mm -hmm. not religious. Yes. And I do understand and can, like there can be like a spiritual bypass, you know, where there's no tangible related object or identity. Yes. So um, I completely understand and appreciate that comment. Yes. And, and however, that said, to uh, I think for all of them, including a broader version of and it is the it, it certainly is. Uh, I can certainly get my mind around this concept that of, of something outside of yourself. You know, I've I've um, 
anyways, so so I won't take us too far down that road. But that's a that's an interesting. <laughs> it's an interesting concept because when we when we start to think about healing and energy and all these other sorts of things, the you you I mean you certainly cannot leave the spiritual part out of it from wherever you you think about that. So. Uh, may I just jump back uh, to a couple of things that you had said earlier? One, you said that the body can heal itself. I agree with you. I mean, uh, I'm not a practitioner or a, or a physician in in the sense of how you work and what your your vast knowledge of it. But to me, it makes complete sense. I, you know, I have a you know sister who worked very closely with a chiropractor for many years and. I've certainly spoke with many chiropractors, uh, and you know, I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to figure out that we were designed to heal ourselves, and that chiropractic. But you're gonna, I think, tell me more than that. You know, is a way of, you know, for lack of a better term, you know, clearing the the spinal cord uh, and freeing it up so that your, uh, you know, that your nerves and the signals going. Uh, are able to do what they do and therefore facilitate the healing. So that's the best that I can pose that. But tell me more about your thinking about how the body is able to heal itself. Sure. And Kevin, I, again, I have to applaud you. I mm. thought that was a beautiful definition of Thank what you. chiropractic can, what it does. And I'm just going to add one more layer to it. You were Please. looking, you were speaking to the dimension of removing nerve interference from the central nervous system so that the body can then communicate or the brain can then communicate with the rest of the body. Mm. So there is an energy component behind it. And that is that there, there is a life force transmission. Yes. So if you can allow that life force to be as vibrant as it possibly can be, then that person becomes more of who they originally were intended to be. Wow. I love that. That's very interesting. And by the way, since you said that, I think, and I've had a couple of guests on who could talk about the flow state, it, 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 you know, with me. And even before I understood the flow state and read a couple of books on, I think, um, uh, Makati Chenk Semen highly uh, wrote mm -hmm. this incredible book on the flow state and really in a scientific term. But one of the things that I've learned about the flow state, and that is other people would say uh, being in the zone, all, all these other sorts of things. Clearly, it's an energy thing. And, and I tell people all the time because I've experienced it, I've practiced it, one, as a speaker, as a musician, as an athlete, that one, you can put yourself into the flow state. And by the way, you can get your audience to also join you in that. How can that be anything other than this uh, energy thing that happens around us? So um, so I, I just think what you're saying, I mean, there's a lot more for me to understand about that. But um, the more that I learn and study about it, the more that I recognize that, yes, we are a ball of energy and you can maybe just by being present, turn somebody on or turn them off. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I believe um, I loved your description of Chick Sent Me High's work. Yeah, um, when it comes to flow, we know mm. that there's a certain amount of uh, effort that needs to be applied to the task. So there's a degree of difficulty that needs to be achieved um, so that you can be literally your focus is 100% on yes. that task at hand. And what you're talking about, yes, there is a sense of self-absorption within yes. that. But then what happens is the collective consciousness of how people or a group can join that individual in that flow state. Very interesting. I love the way you describe that. And part of where I, and, and when, when I started to really recognize it, and again, I kind of felt it because uh, I won't go into it, but I, I often bring up this example that I remember um, uh, Eric Clapton, who's played, I mean, for how many audiences over the years, over 60 years or whatever it's been. I recall seeing him only a few years ago. He was at some sort of a jazz festival or blues festival, I think it was. He came out on stage with just his guitar and, uh, you know, there was a band behind him. He sat and he started playing. And I remember thinking he kind of looked bored. And I said to myself, man, how many times has he done this? You know, how do you, how do you get yourself up? But then here's what I started to notice. 
I started him notice just kind of, he was playing, but sort of playing around, you know, with like some playing some leads and such. And I started to recognize that he, he knew where he was going in terms of the flow state. In other words, he was just kind of uh, relaxing, hanging around, letting things happen, just playing around, not really doing anything fancy. And then you could see Lee slow, slowly see him moving into the state of flow. Suddenly the band picks up their energy. Suddenly the, the audience starts nodding. And then within, let's say 10 minutes, it was just this incredible groove and everybody was in on it. And so um, I, I don't even know what I'm asking or if there's a question behind it, but just to say that, you know, you can create that. I don't know precisely how it all works, but um, but then I would state that also about you know how I guess part of the question is is then how do you how do you take these things? We're kind of off of the topic here of of uh, what we're here to talk about, but that how do people more and more engage that energy on a more you know I mean let's not wait for a concert you know how do you yeah. do that at work. You know, yeah. how do you get into yeah. that flow state and feel more joy, more energy, less stress, whatever the case might be? Uh, there you have it, whatever that question is. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's in perfect divine timing that you're asking this, because I'd like to introduce a, a term. Um, as a musician, you're going to have a definition that's different than a physicist, um, and that is the word of entrainment. One more time. The word entrainment. Entrainment. So... Yeah. And so um, essentially, I'm going to use a couple of different examples. Um, have you heard of the idea that if you walk in, let's say you get a hundred different clocks and you put them all into one room and they're going off at different times and they're not synchronized. And if you leave all of the clocks and you leave the place and you come back after a certain designated amount of time, all of a sudden the clocks are synchronized. No way. Okay. How about take a gymnasium pool of bouncing balls, bouncing balls, bouncing balls, up and up, up and down, up and down, chaos. And if you leave it long enough, they start to resonate and to bounce together. I have never heard this before. This is incredible. So in music, the same thing happens with instruments. I see. Okay, I'm I'm not a musician, but I know enough to know that um, there are uh, discordant frequencies that resonate, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, that create conflict for noise and yes. sound. Mm -hmm. And then there are more harmonic sounds that allow that same kind of frequency to synchronize. The same thing happens energetically when somebody is holding a frequency in the state of flow then the people in the environment that are connected doesn't even necessarily have to be in the same. You and I are entrained right now, and we're yep. not in the same room. Very interesting. So as an energetic healer, I can set a frequency. And my intention is to support the highest good of the person who's receiving the healing. But I hold the frequency, and I hold it at a at a consistent intensity until we're both synchronized and then the healing can begin it's entrainment mind-blowing what you're telling me i have not heard of entrainment before but everything you just said i you know i'm tracking makes complete sense that's really fascinating the way that you just expressed all that with how so then it begins to explain my 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 absolutely lovely wife uh, who I love and adore. She she is the CEO of the Tennessee Philharmonic Symphony uh, uh, Symphony Harmon uh, Tennessee <laughs> uh, Symphony uh, Philharmonic Symphony is what I'm saying. And she uh, and when we talk about this, she's also a musician. And we we talk about this. How is it you bring these musicians together? And sometimes you know it's not all jiving. And then maybe if you have a different conductor, or sometimes you just go, wow. It just all comes together. You basically just describe that with entrainment, right? That they all get into the same flow, the same uh, energy, frequency, whatever it is you call it. This is fascinating stuff. So let's let's go back to. Uh, um, I say this a lot, but yeah, we could we could we could talk a minute here if uh, if uh, on on a lot of different subjects. I can see. 
So you know, let's just go go back a little bit to to burnout and these understandings of burnout. You know, what would you then say to the, the average person out there, either feeling like they're getting to that place or feel like they've gotten there? You know, what's what's sort of you know just some ideas, practical ideas that maybe you would put into place, um, or that you could suggest for them, because there's mm-hmm. a lot of it going on. Yeah. That is the first thing that I would say is to a person that is experiencing burnout. Number one, you are not alone. Mm. Absolutely not alone. Mm. And the second thing that I would say is that there is hope, meaning that, you know, there is life on the other end of burnout. And if you apply and prioritize your healing journey, then it's tangible. It can be your reality. I think from I think the first thing that I encourage my patients, my clients to do is get some blood work, know how severe the effect of chronic stress has been on your on your chemistry. Then you know how to support your chemistry and your physical body. And then take a look at the lifestyle assessment. Sincerely. How much caffeine are you doing? Are you getting enough sleep? I mean, really do it. Do inventory. I love what, that right there. Yeah, do inventory. And and it gets to be, and this is tricky, it gets to be in a state of non-judgment. Mm. It just gets to be from a state of compassion, self-compassion, mm. which is super hard for us. Mm. And just to be able to say, okay, I acknowledge all of this. And yeah, I was using, I was using the, at the time, at the moment, I had, with the resources that I had, I was doing the best that I could. Yes. So no judgment. Just that now it's time to take small sequential steps. We've all heard of Kaizen steps. Yes. If you take small steps, they eventually turn into something much greater, something much more magnificent. Yes. So functional blood chemistry analysis, I do think is a is a as a foundation. Get a good inventory, what's happening as far as the review of your system. Mm. And then also from that, also take a look at um your your um if you want to call it your spiritual practice, take a look at what is happening as far as mindfulness for you your daily activities of what you can do to support yourself and slowing down Mm. and then just allow time and rest to assist. And if, and if they need a good, if they need somebody to assist them, I'm happy to help as a facilitator, but I essentially just guide. I don't do the healing. I'm, I'm just, I just, Take a passive approach and guide. Fair enough. It makes sense. I mean, and and sometimes that's what folks need. You know, this is very interesting what you're saying. I really appreciate it. And I'm sure my audience appreciates these very practical tips. There's another thing that I think about, it, especially as you mentioned taking inventory. You know, I think I can speak from my own experience, but I, I would say it's probably fair to say that uh, other people experience this as well. Maybe everybody when it comes to burnout. So you're just burned out yet you're still moving, you're still going because you can't or you don't have time or there's just so much going on. I mean, you described your life perfectly as you're building this business. Uh, yeah, you can't just stop. I mean, it's there's too many depending on you. There's a lot of stress. And so um, and so, what, what I sense for a lot of people, uh, again, I'll speak for myself, is it all just gets up into my head and I can't tell you if I'm coming or going. If somebody, if my wife were, if I felt this level, I could say burnout, I mean, but that's not really the case anymore for me. It's more just maybe stress or too much going on or whatever case. So maybe some form of burnout. But, you know, my my wife said, so, you know, what's going on? I, I My answer might be something like, I have no idea. I just can't even think straight, you see. And so one of the things that I learned from, I'm trying to think of the author right now, can't quite think of his name right now, but he, he really talks more about productivity and results and all these sorts of things. But he talked about this notion, and this is not, the, you'll recognize what I'm saying, and other people will, will have heard something like this before. He kind of just said that, you know, of course, your brain is analogous to a computer hard drive. And he would ask the question, so, you know, when, you're, when your hard drive is full, what happens? The obvious, it slows down and perhaps even crashes. 
And so he said, one of the things that's going on in the way that he described it, if I can describe it accurately, he said, you know, any thought that you have, and again, he's talking really more about productivity and getting things done. In fact, I think it's called getting results or something. You know, he said, he said, sometimes, you know, people just try to hold too much in their brain. And he said, even if you have like some small thing that you need to do, all of that's lingering in your hard drive. It's all cause, it's all more data that's up there just clouding it. And his big recommendation sort of long, he said, he said, just get it out of your head. He said, sit down with a piece of paper and just start listing it all. And he said, there's a function, there's a thing that happens, or in your case, as a facilitator, it's what I do as a coach. I just try to help people get the stuff out of their head so that they can kind of look at it differently. And, the, but, but to me, this works. It's the same thing as just like putting it on paper and your brain kind of says, I don't really have to let it linger there, even though I'm not thinking about it. It's not lingering there anymore because it's down here on this piece of paper. And so now you can practically look at this long list of things. And there's something about walking away from a session like that and going, wow, I feel better. I mean, I, I just kind of <laughs> can look at it now and not just go, I have no idea. Does any mm -hmm. of that resonate with you, what I'm saying? It does. It does. But I would like to take it from a neuroscience perspective, if Please I may. Please do. Uh, absolutely. Um, so you're bringing the geek of me, the geek out of me today. Geek so away. I, I, geek away. <laughs> um, so within, and I'm going to challenge you, and, I, and I'm not, I, I agree with the author to a certain extent, but okay. I'm going to take it one step Please further. Please do. Yes. Fair you, enough? You got it. Okay. So imagine, um, I'm going to use a story. Okay. So here you are, you and your wife are driving 40 miles an hour down one of your neighborhood streets that you know well. Okay. You're still, you, you're still operating a major mo a motor vehicle. So your executive functions are firing within your brain. Yes. But you happen to know. The next street is first street. The street after that is second street. The street after that is third street. And there's a stoplight there. You know Mrs. Smith who lives in the far corner. You know that um, you're uh, somebody's going to be out mowing their lawn, and you know that people are going to be having out walking their dogs. So you're absorbing all of this information as you are on autopilot, but still operating in your executive function mode. Interesting. Your yes. salient network within your brain. All of a sudden, your wife says, watch out, there's a dog. And then your wiring goes into a task positive network or a, um, there's another term that's escaping me right now, but you shift and all of a sudden you're out of that salient network and you're saying, oh my God, what do I do? Because you don't want to hit the dog. So you you make the executive function to either utilize your senses. Okay, I can swerve to the left and miss the dog. I can push on my brake and stop hitting the dog. I can put my arm in front of my wife so that she doesn't lean forward as I, as I slam on the, on the brakes. So that's a different neuronal network. Hmm. My point is we live in a stimulated society so that you can be operating in your general everyday activities and you go out and out and out and, and you're doing this all day long. Wow. And that's where you get the capacity of going, oh my God, okay, well, I don't even know if I'm coming or going. You got a lot of neuronal activity happening. The beauty of it is that there is a what is called a default mode network that sits a little bit back in the center of the brain, and it minimizes the frontal lobe activity. And this is where your brain can be more at rest. So when you reach that state in prayer and in meditation, so you're not thinking about the external stimuli. You're thinking about what's happening in here. What's happening within myself? That aspect, if you can tap into consciously, deliberately tap into that default mode network, is a game changer. Is you're, a game changer when you talk about productivity. That's fascinating. So you're so you're saying not necessarily doing that by sitting down and meditating but you're saying actively in your life as you carrying out operating your daily life is that what you're saying well it's that's 
a little hard to do when you're activated, you know, doing this all day, going in yeah. and out, in and out, and executive command. But if you sit, if you meditate, or if you sit and you pray, okay. you know, then your brain, the neurology shifts into that default mode network. I see. I see. And so from an entrepreneur's standpoint or a business coach such as yourself, when somebody is overloaded with too many tasks. Okay. Wow. I'm with you. So even though you're like, you're on the clock, you need to be productive. From a corporate standpoint, it would be more beneficial to say, I sense, I see and feel that you're overwhelmed. Please take 15 minutes, go to a quiet room that we have in the building so that you can meditate and then come back out. That and is, then come back out with a fresh mind. That's fantastic. I've heard these sorts of things before, but the way that you laid that out just makes complete sense. Uh, that, you know, hence why, yeah, meditation, mindfulness, all these other sorts of things. And by the way, uh, maybe even something as simple as going, taking a walk, you know, can have some of that effect, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, a mindful stroll in the corporate, in the corporate <laughs> park would be just yeah. fine. <laughs> Yeah, man, that's really good stuff. I mean, that again, another really good practical idea of how people can, yeah, can settle the mind down, settle the, you know, let that flame steady a little bit and uh, and burn without it just blowing all over the place if we stuck with that metaphor. But may, may I ask you, and, and I'm going to ask you, yes, how people can reach out to you and, and more about your programs in a little bit. But one thing about your uh, your website that really caught my attention was a page that said the intention room. I want to know what that is. That sounds cool. Yeah. So the first Monday of every month, I hold space for whoever wants to show up for the intention room. And I do just what we described. Essentially, Kevin, I lead a guided meditation to shift people back into the default mode network and to connect into the various different energy centers located within the physical body. And just to ground down to the frequency of Mother Earth, which we all know is a, is a very soothing resonance. Yes, indeed. And then what we do is we go up into a higher con level of consciousness, where in this world of perception of um, the, I'm going to say the unknown for for the universal consciousness is what I'll call it. Okay. We plant seeds for what people are looking to intend. And then we sense, feel, know, and embrace these seeds of what it would feel like to, uh, to have a sense of ownership of what it is that they desire. And then we bring it back into the physical body so that they can manifest it on their physical plane. Wow. You know that that's that's crazy. I, so so I love this idea of the this the the intention room. So just whomever shows up and spends a certain amount of time with you and tries to, uh, it, yeah, I guess a form of meditation really, and that sort of thing. Is there, um, Mary? Is there an accumulative effect for doing this sort of a thing? So so let's just say, yeah, I'm having a really stressful day, and I do decide to go out in the corporate park and, and maybe walk or just sit and just kind of chill with nature and just not think. And so I feel better, and I go back in, and I feel a little more productive. But is there an accumulative effect of doing this on a regular basis? I sure hope so. I'm banking on it. You're banking on it. Fair enough. I am. Um, because I know new neurological pathways are being created within the brain. Mm, I see. And I know that even if I may be, you know, popping in and out of my executive functions, I can connect to my breath and I can sink into that default mode network easier. So the longer I practice my mindfulness techniques and my meditation, then the easier it is for me to set the intention that every time I walk through a door or a threshold that I connect with my breath and I bring myself into present time. I see. Yes. So, so one, maybe, you know, as you continue to practice, let's just say meditation, one, you can get to that place perhaps um, easier or quicker or, and, and two, but two, and I guess what I mean by accumulative effect, um, it has a, an effect on your mind and your brain and perhaps your spirit in that you are less prone to go back to that place that causes so much stress and 
burnout, if we if we want to say that. Absolutely. Well summarized. Wow, man, that's 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 good stuff. Well, listen, um, you know, first of all, just really two more questions. You know, one, you know, what what uh, what's happening with you and your 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 business or your life or your practice, if you say that you're just uh, super excited about. You kind of mentioned it earlier on, but I still want to ask the question. Yeah. So what I am totally jazzed about right now, Kevin, is that I have created uh, an opportunity for, it's called Bounce Back from Burnout, from Surviving to Thriving. Mm. It's my bespoke program. And essentially, I'm holding space currently for women, mature women that are over you know, 40, 50, and 60, that are truly ready to want to experience more, ha- more health, happiness, and purpose in their lives. And so I truly want behavioral transformation. So it's a five-month program that I offer twice a year. And I'm getting ready to launch my August uh, uh, div- cohort, and then we'll start another one in, in January of 2023. Wow. Is this a live or a virtual event or a little bit it's of both? It's a virtual event. Virtual. Man, that's fantastic. That's really good stuff there. And that, frankly, sets up the perfect segue to ask, you know, about where can people find out about that or about you, yeah, about yeah. your work, whatever the case might be. You know, please just tell people how they can be in contact with you. Sure. Thank you for asking, Kevin. The first place um, for all of you listeners my website is current. It's up to date. It's an active, living, breathing organism. <laughs> so please um, feel free to visit and you'll get up to date information. And the address is www.drmarysanders. So DR Mary and Sanders. I'm, yep. Yeah. And I'm active on social media as far as LinkedIn and Facebook. And the handle on both of those social media outlets is going to be at Dr. Dot Mary E. Sanders. Okay, very nice. And I, I always like to ask, but all of that will be in the show notes that we will uh, that uh, will come with as we put this on YouTube and also on Spotify and all the other places that that it, it arrives to. Well, listen. Any any final thoughts or ideas that you'd like to put forward that um, you know that uh, maybe I didn't ask about or anything to that effect. At the moment, no, Kevin, you have been a delightful host. Oh, I want to express a tremendous amount of grat- gratitude for you as an individual. Um, I honor you as an individual. So thank you for showing up as your authentic self today and your, in your curious uh, being that you are and asking all of the right questions. So it's been a delight. And I just want to say thank you so much. Well, listen, I, I don't want to be, you know, reciprocate just for the sake of reciprocating, but, you know, a great guest like you with that level of depth just makes this job or this work very, very easy. So I thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Mary Sanders, for spending time with us, enlightening our audience, and I hope and would love to stay in touch with you. So thank you so Likewise. much. Well, the thank pleasure's, you. No, the pleasure's mine. Okay, talk to you soon.